Visitors, uh, we would love for the visitors, if you would, to fill out a card so we'll have a record of your attendance. Just put that in the collection plate as it passes by. Uh, we have this morning, Alan Malone will lead the opening prayer. Uh, Brendan Regibal will be leading the closing prayer. And uh, uh, Mark Lannis will be leading the singing. Speaking of the singing, tonight is the singing night, and we will have a singing centered on God's presence, that he is with us. Now, it has a list of songs there that you can choose from, but also it, it makes it well known in the paragraph that you can pick anything you want to. Some of you that may not know any of the songs that are listed or would prefer to sing another song, as long as you pick a song that has to do with God is with us, that's perfect. Now, uh, I do not have my large print Bible with me this morning, uh, and I cannot read that little tiny print that's in the Bibles that anything I found. So I will let Bobby, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, I'll let the, uh, the person who is preaching today, hmm, Frank, I'll let Frank read his verse, okay? All right, uh, we will have now have a prayer. Let us pray. Father, everything around us makes us think of you. We thank you for what we have and we recognize that you're the giver of all. When we struggle with uh, things like uh, diminishing eyesight or hearing, we're reminded that you see and know everything. When we consider the the end of daylight savings time, the, the changing of our clocks, uh, we realize that, uh, that with you a thousand years is a day, that time uh, in some sense has no meaning to deity, that you are beyond time and space. By the way, we're also moved by the thought of the time change of time zones and all of that and today we pray for your people around the world your people on every continent on this globe and we think of hour by hour beginning in the east moving to the west your people praising you every hour more people praising you until this day is done. May you be glorified and lifted up. May we, all of us around the globe, may we be built up in faith and determination. May we be motivated to use the time we have to serve you who are beyond time. Father, thank you that we can be here as your people in this place this hour Please bless us as we worship you. May we sing these songs from the heart. May we pray these prayers as a, a people who are engaged with you, each one of us. 
as we partake of the Lord's Supper, Father, may, may each of us individually and this group corporately be bettered because we have come here to remember your Son. And may our proclamation of him as we partake of the Lord's Supper be one that we continue with our lives and lips all this week. Father, thank you for all those that have received wonderful test results lately. Thank you for those that have come home from the hospital and care centers. Thank you so much, Father, for answering prayers that we've prayed in the past. We pray that you'll be with those, uh, the Binkleys and others that have suffered loss recently. Comfort them, Father. Father, we, we are before you. We are truly in your presence. Help us to, to live with an awareness of that. And this day, may we think of you as being in our presence as we worship and as we go forth from here. May we think of our being in your presence everywhere we are. And may that help us to be better for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our first song this morning is number 501 in your hymnal. Number 501, Worship Your King. We are here for no other reason than to worship, honor, and glorify our God. That is our purpose. Sing all three verses. <coughs> song be number 732. Number 732. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God. <clears throat> so we praise thee, O God, for the Son of
for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing number 511. Number 511, off we come together. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, it's come that time when we as Christians commemorate the death of our Lord and our Savior. I ask at this time for each one of us to meditate, give thanks, and let not the commonplace of this that we do every week become stale in our hearts because we're used to it. But remember the blood that was shed, the body that was broken for us and our sins so that we could be saved. Let's go to God in prayer at this time, please. Our great God and our holy Father, Father, we humbly bow. Father, at this time we praise you and thank you. And it's a bitter joy that we feel. It's joyous because there was one who was willing and who did die for us. And we feel sad and bitter because it's our sins that put him there. Father, we ask that you would help us do this in a worthy manner this morning, that you would bless this bread that represents that body, and that you would bless us, and that we would truly make him Lord in our lives. Father, these things we come in the power of your Son's name. Amen.
Do you ever look anyone? Let's pray again. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this sacrifice that you gave, your only, gave up your only son and he gave up his life in heaven to come to earth to save us, knowing all the while that our sins would put him on the cross. Thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed for us. Help us remember what it means today, but not just today, all the time. Help us remember that without it, our lives would be nothing. Be with us as we take it. In Christ's name we pray. Again, was anyone ever looked? At this time, I'm going to ask Stuart, if he would, to bless our offering, please. Dear God, thank you so much for the time that we get to share together, God, the time that we get to be here and hear your word and be with fellow believers. God, you bless us so much just by having a roof over our head, not only here but at our homes and in the cars that we drive home to. Um. God, thank you so much for just blessing us in so many ways, but one of the many ways you bless us is monetarily to have those things. As we give it back a portion to the work that's here in Millersville, God, bless the gift, bless the giver, help us to do it with a, a heart that is uh, the way that you would want us to have. Um, be with all those gifts, help them to accomplish great things for your kingdom. In your name I pray, amen.
you'd like to go ahead and mark your song books at number three, uh, let's see here, yes, 337. 337 in the hymnal, Is Thy Heart Right With God? That will be our invitation song after Brother Bobby's lesson. For the lesson, we're going to sing number 226, How Great Thou Art, 226. We're going to sing this before our lesson, so please stand and as we sing this together. Me so
Good morning. I want to introduce you to something very quickly. Uh, not everybody's going to have one within reach, but especially if you're visiting with us or maybe you've forgotten your Bible or maybe you're not very familiar with yours and you don't have to admit anything about it, but um, we've put new Bibles in the pew. There's at least one per pew. It's the English Standard Version. It's a, a solid translation. And um, if you'd like to know more about that, I'd be glad to talk with you about it. Uh, there's not one for everybody here. Uh, but if you don't have your Bible and uh, you'd like to uh, follow along, I'm going to be start preaching from the English Standard Version that you find in your pew. And you'll hear me from time to time, not just call out the book, chapter, and the verse, but also the page number so that you can, with ease, get there within your Bible. Uh, we're trying to make the lessons a little bit more accessible. Um, and if you'd like to know more about these Bibles and what we're trying to do with making uh, it easy for everybody to follow along, I'll be glad to talk with you about that particular project. Is there a reason why I don't have the projector in the back? Maybe somebody didn't wiggle their nose. All right, they'll get on that. I just wanted to be sure that that was functioning properly. All right. Well, on page 907 in the Pew Bible, uh, we're gonna, you're going to find John chapter 21. And that's going to be the text of our lesson this morning. It is not my intention to go anywhere else in Scripture, uh, except for John chapter 21, and really to look at what's going on in this particular passage. This particular thought process was uh, requested by the shepherds, and it is, uh, it is good for me to come back to this particular passage. I have problems, honestly, staying away from it. There are so many nuances that you can find, and it's very easy to walk away from the text and not pick up everything, we aren't going to be able to pick up everything. There are some things that will leave you talking about it for a while. But the question arises in, in this particular passage is, do you love me more than these? And it's going to be about verse 15 that you find that. But to give you a little bit of a running start, we're going to back up to verse 12. Jesus is there and he says, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dare to ask him, uh, are, uh, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. Uh, and so with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, and Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. There's a question here about what's going on and, and why Jesus asked him three times and, and the question that's happening. I want to kind of start here and then basically kind of zoom out and then come back in. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. And so if you'll let me do that, we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit and just kind of look at the surroundings. If you go back to chapter uh, 21 and verse 1 through 11, you'll find that they are there and they're on, on the beach um, Jesus had revealed himself again by the sea of Tiberias, verse one, and he was revealed himself in this way. Uh, Simon, who's called Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, uh, let's see, Nathaniel, Canaan of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and other disciples were there. And Simon has said to them, I'm going fishing. And they say, hey, we're going to go too. And just as the day is breaking, uh, they've been out all night, they hadn't caught anything. And they see somebody on the beach. He says, guys, have you caught anything? And is there anything worse you can ask a fisherman that has not caught anything is, have you caught something? And his an their answer is no. And he says, well, cast it on the right side of the boat. And so they cast it and they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. And therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore says to Peter, verse seven, it's the Lord. John recognizes him and says to Peter, that's who it is. And Peter puts on his outer garment because he's stripped for work and jumps into the water and swims all the way back, it seems like. And they all get to land and Jesus there is fixing breakfast. I, I don't know uh, what he made. Uh, it seems as though he broke bread with him. So there's some biscuits there. I don't know. I doubt he had gravy. 
Uh, obviously, he's not from uh, the south here. He had some gravy. Fish there probably also. He's fixing them for him. And you look in verse two, it says that uh, the disciples are there, although it doesn't seem as though all of them are, a, a good portion of them are. Uh, uh, Peter, Nathaniel, James, John, uh, at least the inner three ones that doubted. Uh, they're there, and there's a great point to, to be made about those particular ones there. Although it may not even be that there's any particular reason other than those were the ones who were fishermen. And, and so sometimes we get into that particular verse and try to read more into it than really what's there. Um, but how did we get here? And that's really more important is, is not just are we there, we're there on the beach. By the time you get to verse 12 to 17, they're there that morning having breakfast and you can smell everything in the air cooking and having it there and they're eating. But how did they get there? And you get to verse, uh, you get to the verse where he says, I'm going fishing in verse three. Uh, there's a lot that's made of this particular verse. And, and it's, it's my conclusion that when he gets here, he's not just saying, Hey guys, you know, it's Saturday. <laughs> Ain't got nothing else to do. Why don't we go fishing? And they're saying, yeah, we'll get the cooler full and we'll go out and just, you know, have a good time and see if we can drown some worms. That's, that's not what's going on. If you'll remember, you can turn back, if you want to make a reference, you can turn back to the beginning of Luke chapter 5. That's where he finds these men. He initially calls them from fishing. And even then, it wasn't something that they were doing recreationally. It was their livelihood. And so when you get back to this particular verse in John, you now find them here, and when he says, I'm going fishing, I'm to, of the conclusion that he gets to this point, he says, you know, I'm going back to where I was. I followed the Lord for three years. I've seen everything, and it's just not working out the way I thought that it was going to work out. They've crucified the Messiah, and yes, we've seen him, but um, we haven't seen him lately. I'm going back to fishing. It's giving up. It's saying that, um, this kingdom isn't what it was, everything it was cracked up to be. And so we're going to go put our efforts back in to fishing. Even though Jesus had told them where he, what he wanted them to do and where he wanted them to go, and you can find that in other passages, you still find them here fishing. And they're frustrated by that. Uh, they, they're not having any kind of results. And, and I believe that there's a reason why they're not having results. That if God is still the master of the fish in the sea and spoke them into existence, that they're swimming around that net uh, on purpose. And when he gets down to verse 16, he says, now cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. It's for a reason because it's the same sort of miracle that occurs back in Luke chapter 5. And that's why he says here, um, it's the Lord. It's ringing bells. Uh, in, in, in a lesson that I've presented on a couple of different occasions, in, both in classrooms and from the pulpit here, when you study 1 Peter, I think that this is a critical moment for Peter, where he says to him, listen, you're being called back again. You, you, you're, you've gone back out after the things where you were, and now I'm calling you again to this particular place. Uh, I want you to remember where it was I first called you and what happened in that particular day. And there's a wonderful lesson in that. But he's called here and they re remember it and, and it seems as though they do. And he says, it's the Lord, that, that bell goes off. And so he gets in and he's casting himself and they come back. And now you get down to the end of our text about verse 15. They finished breakfast. Um, they've, I don't know that they ate all of 153 fish that were there. I know that uh, they were done. And Jesus asked the question, do you love me more than these? And there's wonderful debate on what he means when he says, do you love me more than these? Let's eliminate a couple of things. If you're taking notes, this isn't going to be there. Um, this isn't going to be a particular place where you're going to have bullet points over the, of the head. I, you take these notes how you want to. Is he saying to him, do you love me more than these bread and these fish? I think that's kind of irrelevant, but we do have to kind of at least eliminate it. Do you love me more than the things that I've given you physically. And I don't think that that has any bearing, all, even though it's given to us that he had bread and fish. I don't think that he's asking him, did you like me more than breakfast? Because the answer to that is, is a resounding, well, of course. So I don't think that, that that plays into it yet. And why would Jesus ask that? It could be that he's asking him, do you love me more than going fishing? 
Do you love me more than uh, this occupation? Uh, is, 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 are you, where is your dedication lie in this world? Are, are, you, are you following my mission or are you following yours? And certainly that would fall in line with some of the other passages that you find where Peter is kind of uh, out of joint. And particularly I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 16 where he says, you don't have your mind set on God's interest, but on man's. And that certainly does play a role into it. Do you love me more than these? And he could be uh, referencing the occupation that they're having. It, it could also be that he's saying, do you love me more than these? And there's a strong argument to be made that he's referencing the other disciples. Do you love me more than these other men? Because if you remember at the betrayal, he says, he says to Jesus, he says, I'm, I, I, though anybody else may betray you, I'm going to be the one that goes with you both to prison and to death. And I'm inclined to believe the latter, that he's, that he's saying, all right, you remember you said that. Now that we've been through some things together over the last little while, how do you love me now? Where, where is your dedication now, Peter? And that's where, I tend, uh, that's where I tend to land. And so he asked him, he says, do you love me more than these? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. It, it's, you know, I don't know that that's the answer that I, that I would give, but that's his answer. Um, I, there's things that are lost. We talked about this even this morning in our Bible class that you lose when you have just text, you lose voice inflection, you lose body language, you use, uh, lose a lot of other things there. So when he says, do you love me more than these? He says, yes, Lord, you, you know, you know, I love you. Uh, there's, those are tough questions to answer sometimes though, aren't they? Do you love me? Uh, there's always that moment in a relationship uh, as, you know, you find a girlfriend or you find a boyfriend and, and, and one of you says, you know, where are we at? Uh, you know, we have to define the relationship. They call it the DTR talk. Um, you can read about it in, in the book, Not a Fan. Uh, if you haven't read that book, I'd recommend it to you. Where he talks about coming to grips with the point where you say to yourselves, um, what are we doing with this relationship? You know, I, I'm not here in this relationship. Uh, I heard one woman say, I'm not in this relationship to find more friends. I got plenty of friends. Okay. Well, Jesus is, is asking that type of question, I think, here. When he says, he says, do you love me more than these? He's asking him to reaffirm something. And so it's, it's not a joke. In the conversation, it's pretty solemn. And if you're taking notes, this will be a blank that you can fill in. It's a serious question. Do you love me the way that you said that you did? You said that yours was the, the highest form of dedication among these men. Do you love me more than these? Is that the case? And Peter, if that's the case of the question, Peter doesn't really answer it. He just says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He answers it without answer. Well, of course. You know, uh, Frank, what was it we mentioned yesterday in our conversation? You know, that it was important for us to communicate things because you can't just say them once. You have to say them over again. You know, you can't just tell your wife, well, listen, I told you I loved you the day we got married. And if think, something changes, I'll let you know. It's, it's not like that here. He says, Lord, you know I love you. And again, I don't know the, the, the inflection of his voice, but Jesus says, all right, if, that, if that's the case, if you love me, he says, feed my lambs. The result is that if, you've got, if you do love me, if you have an affection towards me, if yours is the, the chiefest, as you said it was, then there's a responsibility that you have. Some people, again, dig into the feed my lambs responses. It's kind of given back to him, uh, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, as though those may be three different concepts that he's trying to get at him. I'm not convinced of that. Uh, you're welcome to talk with me about that. I think they all tend to have the same message. It's the same reason why he's asking him three times. But he says, listen, if you love me, then you have to take what it is that I've given you. There's, there's a responsibility that you have for something that is mine. Whether it's sheep or it's lambs, whatever, your responsibility is to, is to make sure that they are nour nourished and cared for. 
And I don't know how long it lapses between verse 15 and 16, but he says to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I don't know if, G if Peter had a question mark on his face where he goes, Tend my, Jesus, you got lambs? I, when, when did you get lambs? A minute ago, you were dead. We haven't seen you in a couple of days. You were on the cross before that. Did I miss something? You picked up some lambs? Where, Lord, I'm a fisherman. This doesn't make any kind of sense. So I don't know if there was a question mark on his face or if there's a discussion that may be interjected here. You know, when we have the narratives of the Gospels, they're not exact histories and, and they're not meant to be exact histories. Save maybe, maybe you could make the argument for Luke. But even still, there are things that are left out because uh, we're trying to tell, an, a, tell a, a, an account of the story, not necessarily an exact, precise history. So the next thing that, that we're given in the text is, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I mean, we're just going to hit repeat and go through this again. And the only thing that varies a little bit is when Jesus says to him, tend my sheep, you know, take care of those that I've asked you to take care of. And right again, it comes around a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. This is where it changes. And there's some things that are subtle in the Greek. And, and, and if you've looked at this passage before, you'll, you'll know that um, it changes from agape, the agape love, to the word phileo. And for those of you that are into that sort of thing, uh, there's an agape love that is, is uh, unbound. And there's the phileo love that tends to have more of a family type of brotherly love associated with it. And there's some people that believe that whenever Jesus gets to this particular passage, uh, then to verse 17 and 18 in the third time that he says he's changing his tone, that he's going, well, do you, I'm not asking anymore if you love me. I'm asking if you like me. Uh, that's the closest thing that we have in, in, in our language uh, to it. And I wrestle with that. I, I, there, was a, a, there was a time I really wanted to, you know, to make a sermon lather out of that one and and not so much anymore. I do think that it's an interesting, interesting take uh, on, on the passage. But even so, he's still asking him if he loves me. I mean, at the end of the day, if your wife asks you if you love you, and she asks, asks you, do you love me? And then she says, do you like me? She's still asking a similar question. There's still, a, there's still a, uh, a asking about a dedication thing. And if you don't think that that's solemn or, or less solemn, it is. It's very solemn, it's very pointed, and, and, and not only that, it's personal. And I think that that's really what we're getting after here. I think sometimes, again, the details that are brought out in this, um, in some of the original language, uh, can be distracting. Don't get me wrong, I, I like to get nerdy about some of the Greek words as much as anybody else, but I think here it, it may be distracting. At one point I caught myself uh, even back in, and let me throw this out at you, uh, in verse 11, where he talked about the, the large pull of fish, there was a, an enormous discussion on why there were 153 fish. If you'd like to have that discussion, that's definitely a lunchtime discussion. And again, I think we start picking apart the, the text because we, we, we miss what's going on. The number that I think is important here is three. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Three. How many times does he need to make it back up to him? I don't necessarily mean that he's, well, if you say you deny me three times, now you're going to say you love me three times. But I do think that that's the point. You had your chance then, and now that I'm here with me, what, what do you say? It's almost another version of, again, Matthew chapter 16, who do men say that I am? It's in the moment where you were scared and, and you regretted that. I mean, you remember that Peter will go out and weep bitterly. Now that we're here, how do you feel about me? And everything else underneath that is nuanced. And what Jesus is saying by asking him the third time is, this is you and me, Peter. I told, you said you were, you were willing to go both to prison and to death and you, because of your dedication to me, and that didn't happen. And now it's you and me again, even though there's other people around, and, and we're going to have to have this 
defining of the relationship again. This is personal. This is not Jesus versus the disciples. This is not Jesus versus the world. This is Jesus coming back specifically for Peter. And that's why, to me, it's so powerful. It's because it's personal. And that's why I think that when you get down here to verse 17, and he says, he says to him the third time, do you love me? That it hurts some. I've often wondered how to read the, the phrase, Peter was grieved. There's, it's hurt. He knows. He knows why I asked him the third time. Regardless of any speculation that we have, he's there. And he knows that the third time, and there seems to be in his answer a nod to that when he says, Lord, you know everything. In other words, you know what I have done. You know my mistakes. You know that I haven't been who I need to be. And you know that even in all that, I love you. And even at that, Jesus doesn't say, oh, that's okay. You know, here's a pat on the head and a cookie and walk on. He gets right back at him. And, and what I love about this is that the, the message hasn't changed. At the end of everyone, he's still, he's still telling him, you've got something to do. You need to be busy with what I've asked you to do. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Why in the world are you fishing, Peter? Why are you here? If you love me, what have I asked you to do? I've asked you to go and represent the great shepherd. And it's interesting to me to note when you go back to the end of 1 Peter, that he'll make references to the great shepherd. And he'll talk about he himself being a fellow elder or shepherd. That he'll have that sort of language as he speaks. He doesn't refer to himself necessarily as a fellow fisherman but as someone who is looking after those who need tending. It's an interesting nuance there if you want to chase that one down later on. And so you get down to the end of the, the indictment and the reconciliation, if you'll let me say it that way. He says, I truly say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you would stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said by, to show what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, and isn't this interesting? Follow me. You think Jesus is just going to go walk off somewhere? What is he asking? He's telling him, it, it's, he's using the same sort of language as that other rabbis would use at the time to their disciples. He, when he says, follow me, he's not turning and walking off. He's saying, you need to come and you need to follow and learn my teachings. And Peter gets that because he says in verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who leaned back against him on this, during the supper and said, Lord, who is going to be the one that betray, betrays you? And Peter saw him and said to him, Lord, what about this man? And he said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, but Jesus did not say that he was not to die. He just says, if it's willing to remain until I come, what is that to you? And his point is, listen, it doesn't matter what the other guys, I'm asking you to follow me. I'm asking you to tend my sheep. I'm asking you, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than you said you did the other night? It's challenging. Well, here's the applications that come. And you, again, there's places for you to fill these things in, but uh, they're not tough. See, because the tough part about this lesson is not going through and digging out the facts of what happened. The, the indictments are not just to Peter. I believe that by extension they're to us. And so the question remains, do you love me? Do you love the Lord? And you can ask that any way you want to. We can go back and wander it down, can't we? And we could say, do you love the Lord more than the physical things that fill you up? And certainly that's a great question to ask because there's plenty of physical things that do fill us up and distract us from God, don't they? And although we admitted that that's not exactly what he's talking about in the text, I do think that that's a fair question of us to ask of ourselves. Do you love me more than these things over here? 
Do you love me more than, you know, your hobbies and the special, you know, things that you really get intoxicated with? And listen, I, don't anybody go out of here and say, Brother Blackburn said we can't have hobbies because that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying they can't come between you and the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us in here flirts with that. Every one of us does. And we would do well to ask ourselves the questions on a daily basis. Do we love the Lord more than this? And if that's the case, we may need to think about putting those things down. At least until we can get our priorities straight. Because the Lord is not asking to play second place or fifth place or last. <clears throat> the other question that comes to me after this is, well, do you even like the Lord? And, and again, I, I, I know that there's that change from agape to vileo that some people make, make more of in the text than they need to. But let me ask you a very serious question here. I mean, I, I think that this really kind of gets to the, there's a lot of people that like Jesus. I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, the way he's painted a lot, what's not to like? I mean, he loves you and he gives you all grace and mercy. And it's painted to us that, well, all you have to do is just kind of believe and, you know, you'll be just fine. And if I have Jesus in my heart, well, that's really all that matters. And there's really no dedication that comes as long as I just like Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. Although you may be able to search and find him in that little text box on Facebook, Jesus Christ isn't something you just go up and click like. His, our relationship with him is not something we just kind of give him a thumbs up from time to time. Yeah, that's a good thing, Jesus. I'm glad you said that. He's not just somebody that you, you know, high five. It's great to have some Jesus on Sunday morning. He is personally challenging us to a very solemn task of taking him to other people. He's personally asking us, listen, do you, if you even like me, this is, this is what this is about. And in the same way that, that Peter has to wrestle with the three times, can you imagine, listen now, can you imagine if Jesus came to you and said, hey, listen, why don't you come down and sit with me? We're going to talk for a minute. And in the course of that conversation, for every time that you had denied the Lord somehow, that he asked you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Let me tell you, for most of us, it wouldn't be just three times. For most of us, we'd be there the rest of the day. Jesus would have to make some lunch and some dinner. And we'd be broken about all the times where we chose ourselves over the Lord. Because in our deeds and in our actions, we didn't even like him. We love the Lord when, when it goes the way we want it to. But when Jesus gets in the way, when Jesus says, well, this is how I've instructed things to be done. Well, now it's different. Now it's different. And that really brings us to the last point of the applications. Will you do what he asked you to do? Will you do what Jesus asked you to do? And it's really not even what he asked. I mean, when Jesus, when Jesus says, do you love me? That's the question. And, he's, and the answer is yes. It's, it's, here's the responsibility that goes with that. It, it's, it's not even, although it comes off as a statement and, and a command, it is, it is almost in, inferred that if you love me, this is what happens. You know, Jesus will say in other places, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now listen, this is not one of those silly moments that, that sometimes happens between us as brethren and, and, as, and as, uh, in, our, in our relationships. You know, well, if you love me, you'd do this. You know, if you, if you love me, you'd know this. Jesus is not putting some silly stipulation on our relationship. Well, if you love me, you just have to prove it. 
He's not being childish. What he's saying is that if you love me, this is what naturally follows. That there is, there is a naturally, there is an outflow of our love for the Lord that goes, if I love him, I, I must therefore, I, my eyes are opened. I see his sheep. I see their needs. And therefore I am compelled to go and do those sorts of things. It is one of those moments where, not where we would, cross our arms and, and hold our nose up and say, if you love me, you did something. But that there would be an outflow where someone would say, listen, I know that they love me because this happens. This is how it is expressed. It is just a natural outflow of, their, of who they are. And that's what Jesus calls us to. And here's what's frustrating. And it's not just frustrating to me. This isn't Brother Blackburn on a rant. I think this is frustrating to the Lord in this moment. But if the answer is yes, Lord, you know, yes, Lord, you know, yes, Lord, you know, then where is the fruit of your love? Where is that? Where is the outpouring of it? And Jesus isn't behaving any differently. He isn't asking any different question in this context, I believe, than any other place where God asks his people, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you serving me? Where is my dedication? And the prophets, he'll ask, you know, why do you bring in the blind and the lame? Why do you defraud me the, 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 the tithes and the offerings? Where are you? Jesus is challenging us to do and be better. And this morning when you get to this text, you have some serious soul searching to do, and so do I. Do you love me more than these? You'll have to answer that question not just now, but today. Do you love me more than these? We're going to come back and sing tonight, how great is our God. Let me ask you something. Let me ask you something in all seriousness. What do you got going on that's much more important than that? What do you got going on that's much more important than that? Anybody? Well, you know, I've been planning on this particular whatever, and it's more important than me singing praise to the Lord. And some of you may say, well, you know what, it, it gets dark now, and you know, I know we've had the time roll back, and I can't get back. Do you know, in this congregation, there are, there are three 15-passenger vans. <laughs> and there's a whole, and I got two of them. Do you know, when you go out and look, there are all kinds of SUVs out here. There's not one car that only has one seat. If you didn't have a ride, I bet there's all sorts of people that would love to, act, love to bring you to church. In fact, there's a group of people that if you just said, hey, I need a ride, that's what they signed up to do. We're going to have to have some humility, folks. What do you love more than the Lord? I remember growing up, the preacher would frequently end his sermons and he would ask you, what trinket do you have in your hand that you won't let go of for heaven? What little thing do you have in your hand that's more important than the Lord? I don't know where you are and I don't know where you'll be and I don't know the reasons. But God knows all those things. And you'll have to answer to him whether or not you love him. And the things that you say and the things that you do. What's your answer going to be? Marcus picked out the song number 337, Is Thy Heart Right With God? And that's appropriate for the lesson this morning. We're going to ask each other the question. This isn't, this isn't aimed at anybody. This is aimed at us. Every one of us has to ask, ask the question, have our affections been nailed to the cross? 
And over and over, over and over, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? And don't get lost in the repetition of it. Sometimes that's easy. But over and over, listen to the people around you asking, are you right with the Lord? Are you right with the Lord? Are you right with the Lord? And don't walk out of here unless you're right with the Lord. If we can help you in whatever way, whether it's to be baptized or to make yourself right with prayers, we want to help you do that. The Lord wants you to be close to him. Will you come? Come now while we stand and sing to encourage each other. John Keithley has let it, been know, let it be known that for personal reasons, he is stepping down from serving as a deacon. We certainly appreciate that John, all that John has done as he served. You know, John, uh, the revelator in Revelations, talks about the four and twenty elders and the heavenly host praising God with a new song. Tonight, we're going to try our meager best to emulate that worship and in thinking about that don't you all want to go to heaven and be able to sing the right notes and the right melody and sing in harmony uh, you won't be able to make any mistakes there you'll be able you're able to sing the songs perfectly uh, just think about that and come tonight and get your practice in Closing thought of song, we're going to sing number 237. <laughs> had to pause just for a second coming up. Because I had to do a quick evaluation from the time that I walked from up there to up here. Tough. Is thy heart right with God? Do you love me more than these? I almost had to have Frank lead the song. Sometimes we need to pause in our day, guys and ladies. <clears throat> Thank you, Bobby, for that message. I needed it. Don't know if anyone else needed it, but Mark needed that this morning. Thank you. We're going to sing this song, His Grace Reaches Me. It truly does. Come back tonight and sing with us. To God be the glory, not us, but to God. His grace reaches me. We'll sing both verses. 
Precious and glorious Father in heaven, Father, we count ourselves as the most blessed to be loved by you, Father, to be blessed by you, and to share in all the many riches that come to us spiritually and physically through your Son. Father, help us to answer the question that has been posed to us this morning. Do we love you more than these? And no matter what we put under these, help us, Father, to answer truly for ourselves, whether we do or not. Father, we want to love you. Father, we want to give you our very best. Help our hearts, Father, that they may be more loving like you and how you've shown us to love. Please, Father, help us in our study of your word, to see how it is that we can love and ought to love both yourself and your son and the word that you've given to us. As we depart this place, Father, 
Help us to consider these things and bring us back here safely tonight that we may worship you in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Father, lifting up your name high and holy. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.